There are lots of factors that determine what our body does with the food that we consume. One of the most important of which is our current energy balance. In other words, does our body need energy or does our body have energy? If our body needs energy, it's going to take the food that we consume, break it down, and use it to produce the energy that we need in order to survive and maintain our body fitness. If our body has enough energy, a lot of the food we consume will actually be stored for later energetic purposes. In this video, we'll actually, we're going to be exploring uh, the different factors that contribute to both energy expenditure and energy intake and how that relates to what our body does with the food that we consume. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to talk about the factors that affect energy intake and the factors that affect energy expenditure. This is particularly important because this gets at something called energy balance, and energy balance largely determines what our body does with the foods we consume. Does it burn the energy or burn the food that we consume rapidly to produce the energy we need to survive, or do we have enough energy already? In which case, much of the food we consume is actually going to be stored for later use, often in the form of adipose tissue. And of course, an overaccumulation of adipose tissue can lead to obesity. This can be highly problematic. As of 2009, the CDC reports that about 33% of all American adults and 16% of all American children can be considered as obese. This is a significant increase in those percentiles within each of those, within each of those groups uh, since, since the previous study done in 1980. Now, obesity has a host of health-related problems. First off, people with obesity are much more prone to developing uh, diseases such as type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. There is also a massive increase in the amount of, of health care-related costs for people who are obese. They tend to have more problems, and those problems tend to be serious, more serious than in people that are not obese. So what has been driving this increase in obesity over the last 30 or 40 years within our country? Well, there are a number of obesogenic events that may have contributed to this. So obesogenic is a term that describes um, certain drivers of obesity or things that we believe can contribute to obesity. One of the most important of these is actually an increase in the prevalence of fast food, uh, fast food service restaurants um, in the country, as well as the increased uh, consumption of foods from those fast food goods by the American public uh, on an average basis. Concomitant with that is an increase in the average portion size. So the portions, the amount of food that, that the average American consumes at any one given meal, whether it's fast food or home cooked, is significantly larger than it was just 30 or 40 years ago. Another large increase, uh, another large uh, obesogenic effect that may be affecting uh, and maybe contributing to obesity in this country um, uh, is the increase in availability of transportation. Um, in the second half of the 20th century, it became a lot more common for, uh, for families to have multiple vehicles. Um, yes, of course, vehicles are useful for getting from point A to point B, but prior to that, um, having a single vehicle in the home often caused individuals to have to walk places or find other means of transportation. These, of course, increase the amount of physical activity that people are getting. Now that we can simply drive everywhere, um, a lot of people opt to do that as opposed to walking. This decreases the amount of, uh, the amount of exercise that they're doing on a regular basis. There's also been a huge increase in the amount of television and screen time that we're getting as a population. Um, so, of course, you know, going from you know, back in the, maybe the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, when there may be a single television in the home with a few channels, now there are often multiple TVs, TVs in every room, not to mention we have all of our portable devices, tablets, laptops, uh, cell phones, and we can consume digital media pretty much any time of day, and quite often we do. Uh, this all contributes to a more sedentary lifestyle where we're not getting the exercise we need. In other words, we're increasing our energy intake in terms of food sizes um, and the sources from where we're getting our food, but we're also decreasing our amount of energy expenditure because we're not walking as many places, we're not riding bikes, we're not uh, we're spending more time we're spending more time consuming digital media and watching TV as opposed to doing more physical exercise. This is also present in the workplace. Um, many American workplaces now um, require the use of, of technology on a regular basis. So whether it's an office space where um, you know, you're using more computers, things are done via email, you're spending less time moving about, you're spending more time at your desk, 
or even in industry where much of what is occurring now in manufacturing has now either been automated or uh, or now involves uh, the use of, of robotics. Uh, so even in industry, there's less physical activity going on and more people are just sort of standing in one place operating a machine. Of course, that doesn't go for all fields, but in general, as a whole, more and more of us are doing jobs that don't require nearly as much physical activity. As I said, the end result is a situation where we are consuming more and we are expending less. So this sets up this sets off our energy balance. And as a result, we're beginning to become more obese as a society. So how can we help combat this? How can we turn the tide against these obesogenic events? Well, we can do this in different ways. So at an individual level, uh, try to eat fewer prepared foods. Try to uh, eat fast food less. When you cook at home, decrease your portion sizes. And if you do have to eat out, try to eat healthier. Don't rely on those deep fried or um, high caloric sort of low nutrient foods uh, that we often consume when we eat out. We can also try to watch less TV. Trade some of your TV watching time for maybe uh, going for a walk or using a treadmill or doing something to be more, become more physically active. Or pair it, right? We can, uh, you can listen to music or a book on tape or watch TV while you're on your treadmill or while you're going for a run. Although I wouldn't look at your screen while you're going for a run. Uh, that could probably be unsafe if you're doing that. We can also try to do better in terms of what we do in our daily life. So at work, maybe take the stairs instead of taking the elevator. Maybe you could ride your bike to work if that's feasible or walk to work if that's feasible. Find, find time in your day to create a, a space for you to get some physical activity. At the same time, try to eat healthier, eat smaller portion sizes, try to, try to prepare your own foods as opposed to relying on prepared foods, which often contain um, an improper amount of nutrients or tend to be more calorically dense while not having the nutrition that we need to get out of it. We can also act on these obesogenic factors at the community level. So for example, if you look around your workplace and maybe there's a cafeteria there or there are vending machines, Request that your office space or your school request that they begin serving some more healthy foods. Uh, maybe they don't always have to have pizza for lunch at the, at, the, at the school cafeteria, or maybe the vending machines could include some more healthy options so that you have access to those when you can't bring your own food. Try to patronize local markets. Look for local farm markets. Buy fruits and vegetables locally. Support those things because that drives down the price of, of healthier foods in your area. Try to advocate on behalf of school lunch programs. Um, a lot of times children get their meals from school because they don't have any other option and they, are get, they get whatever the school serves. If your school district isn't serving healthy, nutritious meals, if they're serving them you know, pizza every day or, or other foods that aren't particularly nutritious, then the nutrition that those children are getting is not particularly good. Advocate on behalf of those things. Also, advocate for uh, your community to have things like bike lanes and walking paths and, and places where people can actually go and get physical activity in a safe and enjoyable manner. At the national level, you should advocate for policies that increase the walkability or bikeability of cities. You should be advocating on behalf of policies uh, that make, uh, make healthier foods less expensive uh, for nutrition programs and programs that provide access uh, to healthy, nutritious foods for people that might not otherwise be able to afford them. Um, and we should, we should do the best we can to advocate for policies, uh, for public health policies that help to combat the obesity epidemic that's occurring in our country. So as I said at the outset of this video, we need to work on getting proper energy balance. Energy balance is just really a function of you know, the balance between how much energy we're taking in and how much energy we are expending. So you can either have a positive or a negative energy balance. If you have a positive energy balance, that means you're actually taking in more nutrients than you need. In other words, you're bringing in more calories than you're expending. In this case, what your body's going to do if you have a positive energy balances, it's going to take the foods, it's going to break it down and it's going to use the foods that it needs. Maybe if you're deficient in a few uh, different nutrients, it'll use that. But the majority of the energy that you're taking is actually going to be stored. Some of it will be stored in the form of carbohydrate energy, but in the form of glycogen. But really, that's a small reserve designed for sort of fast acting needs. Overwhelmingly, your body's going to store the majority of that stored energy in the form of adipose or fat tissue. If you have a negative energy balance, that means that you're taking in fewer calories than your body actually is demanding. 
in that case, your body is going to have to actually mobilize stored energy. So this is how you know glycogen stores are going to be utilized. This is how fat stores are going to begin to break down and be used for energy. Your body sort of revolves between either positive or negative energy balance, and depending on where you are, what your body's going to, it depends on what your body is going to do with the food that it consumes. So how do we know how much energy we actually need to consume? Well, the Institute of Medicine has actually come up with something called the Estimated Energy Requirement, or the EER, uh, that factors in how old you are, it factors in your height, your weight, the amount of physical activity you do, and it's basically this big, long calculation um, that you could put all of your demographic information into, and it'll calculate about how much energy you need on a daily basis. The goal would be to get exactly that amount. Of course, that's probably nearly impossible. Um, and also, this is just an estimate, so it's hard to say exactly what you should be getting. But the bottom line is it should give you a ballpark average of this is how many calories you're, you're burning in any given day, and therefore, this is how much energy you consume. If you're consuming more energy than your EEG, you're probably in a positive energy balance state, which means your body's going to be storing energy. You're probably going to gain weight. If you are getting fewer calories than your, than your EER, um, your estimated energy requirement, then you're going to be burning calories. So if that's if you're trying to lose weight, you want to stay in that negative energy balance side of things. Um, it's a big, long calculation, kind of com complex. The good news is there are a lot of different apps out there. There's websites out there that will actually calculate this for you. Um, if you've ever used an energy app, it's you know one of those you know those calorie tracker apps or those exercise apps. What do they ask you? Well, they ask you how tall you are. They ask you how much you weigh, how old you are. They're basically taking all that information, putting it into this calculation and saying, these are how many calories you should be consuming on a regular basis. Um, there are a few factors that it doesn't calculate. So for example, um, that calculation would be wrong if you are pregnant um, and nursing because you get different, you know, there's different requirements there um, at that point. So what factors go into our total energy expenditure or our TEE? In other words, where does all of the energy we consume actually go? Well, about 60, 60 to 70% of your total caloric energy consumption on a daily basis goes into your, daily, your basal metabolism. Your basal metabolism is really how much energy your body needs to function on a daily basis, just housekeeping keeping your brain functioning, keeping your heart beating, keeping your liver functioning properly, and all the organs in your body, they all demand energy to function. 60 to 70% of the energy you bring in goes there. It's dedicated to just keeping your body running. About 10% of the energy you consume is given to the enzymes your body needs to perform energy breakdown. So in order to convert the food you eat into things that you can use, whether it's being stored or used to convert energy, about all of those things are going to involve these proteins called enzymes and enzymes function most commonly through the use of consuming an energy metabolite called ATP okay about 10% of the energy you consume on a daily basis it goes just to that to power those enzymes your body needs to break down food so the remaining 20 to 30 percent are used for uh, sort of your physical activity and that physical activity could simply be walking to the refrigerator to get your next meal or walking at work or what you do. The percentage, and I'll say this, this is the one chunk of your total energy expenditure that you really have control over. If you are a sedentary person, a very small proportion of your energy is going to be consumed through physical activity because you're just not doing that much. If you are a highly active person, a significant proportion of the energy you consume on a daily basis is going to be going, it's going to be more on the higher end, about 30% of your energy consumption is going to be tied to um, your physical activity. So if you're an, act, an avid runner or you're a biker or a hiker or things like that, or you play soccer, if you're doing that on a regular basis, you're going to have a higher percentage of your activity or of your energy consumption tied to your physical activity. If you're a more sedentary person that doesn't do a lot of physical activity, well, then that percentage is going to be very low. So what factors affect energy intake? Well, in large part, this is actually tied to whether or not you're hungry. And there are a lot of physiologic factors that go into contributing to whether or not you feel hungry. So uh, the hypothalamus, as we keep going back to the hypothalamus, whether we're talking about temperature regulation, um, or the or the thirst reflex to consume uh, to consume drinks when we're thirsty, hunger is controlled by the same part of the brain, and the the hypothalamus is tasked with um, receiving both neural and um, and like endocrine signals, uh, hormonal signals to determine whether or not you should be hungry or not. And these signals come largely from the peripheral parts of the body, from organs like the stomach. 
um, and, and, and other parts of the body. The stomach is a very important control point uh, for this. So uh, the stomach actually can send a number of, of cues to your body um, and to your brain. So for example, when you feel hungry, that pain, those hunger pangs, those are real. Uh, when you hear that growling of your stomach when you haven't eaten in a while, that's a real thing. That's your empty stomach uh, sort of churning and essentially saying like, feed me, uh, there's nothing in here, uh, which means I'm hungry. and that can actually be interpreted by your brain. Your brain actually senses that, your hypothalamus senses that and says, yeah, we, we should probably eat something at this point. Your stomach can actually release hormones as well that sort of set your body up in a position for, for sort of making you feel hungry, That the feelings that you get uh, when you need to eat food. Your fat or adipose tissue can also contribute to this. So um, a couple decades ago, it was discovered that your adipose tissue or your fat tissue can actually produce a hormone called leptin. So leptin actually does the opposite of hunger pangs. It's a hormone that basically tells your body, hey, we're satiated, we're not hungry any longer. And the discovery of leptin was actually um, heralded as a potential breakthrough discovery for how we might be able to control the obesity epidemic. The idea was if we could uh, give people who were obese, if, uh, if we could give them artificial leptin and basically increase their leptin levels, maybe their brain would interpret that as, hey, they're, they're not hungry any longer. As a result, they would eat less and then they would eventually begin to lose weight. Here's the problem. We then discovered that people who are, uh, who are obese um, are actually insensitive to leptin. So in other words, it appears that as you tend to accumulate adipose tissue, your brain kind of turns off, it stops listening. It stops listening to that leptin signal. And so giving people leptin as a supplement who are already obese, it doesn't actually work that well. But it is an example of how your body sort of communicates with itself. Hunger, you know, stomach pangs, uh, growling stomach, I'm hungry. Body secretes leptin, I'm full, we don't need to eat more. So that opposing thing. Your hypothalamus, your brain is actually able to directly sense nutrients in your bloodstream as well. And a lot of that actually translates to cravings. You may have actually heard it's not a bad idea to listen to your cravings. If you crave something salty, it probably means that your brain is detecting that you have low amounts of sodium or chloride or potassium uh, that you need to get into your body. Um, if you know if you're if you're feeling like you want something more proteiny, uh, perhaps your body knows that it's low on amino acids or on things that it, it might need. So um, it's actually interesting. Your sort of your subconscious brain is sending cues to your conscious brain of like I'm hungry, but I'm hungry specifically for this thing. Why? Well, probably because your brain has actually detected in the blood that there's not a lot of this thing around, and we ought to get some more of it. And how your brain interprets these signals and how your brain how you choose to respond with your conscious brain to these largely controls how much you eat, when you eat, and what you eat. Genetics also plays a role. Um, it's not as simple as saying like, you know, you have this gene and if you have a certain version of this gene, then you're going to be, you know, more likely to be overweight than not. It's not that simple. There are often, there are likely hundreds of genes um, that interact and those interactions tied with to your environmental actions also often contribute. But the one thing we do know is that people tend to be similar in terms of their body shape and their fat content uh, to their parents. So um, we, we do know that there is a genetic link there, but like I said, it's probably a very complex one. And there are certainly other things that contribute. So for example, behavioral influences uh, are also important in terms of your energy expenditure. Um, people tend to eat what they like. And if you like certain foods, you're going to be driven towards those foods. Um, and if you dislike certain foods, then you're probably not going to eat more, eat, eat those types of foods. So, um, you know, if you're someone that really enjoys eating fast food, then you're probably going to eat more of it. If you're someone that really doesn't like the taste of fast food, then you're probably going to eat less of it. And how we tend to, you know, we, we eat the things that we like. And sometimes it's hard to break those habits. Of course, there are also societal influences as well. So, um, you know, in the United States, we tend to have large portion sizes. We have buffet restaurants and, you know, even when you go to, uh, you know, even if you order small things at fast food restaurants, quite often they're significantly large in terms, larger than the portion size that you actually need. Um, you may also have uh, family influences. So for example, if, if, if in your family, it's traditional to, you know, to eat certain types of foods and there are a lot of those certain types of foods and, you know, there's pressure to, you know, clean your plate and that type of stuff. Um, that will also contribute to that as well. So what things actually affect our energy expenditure then? Well, there are also likely physiologic and genetic things that contribute to how our, 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 our body shape or 
you know, how often our body expends energy or at what point our body says, this is where I start storing energy and this is where I start expending energy. Um, two of the leading hypotheses are either the set point or settling point hypothesis. Uh, it really sort of get, they both sort of get at the same idea of when does your body say I'm in positive energy balance and when do I say I'm in negative energy balance? Uh, they do tie those to sort of different factors. The problem with a lot of these hypotheses is they seem to be oversimplifications. Um, there is a lot more to it than that. And to simply say that this person just has a higher set point and that you know their body stores energy sooner than other people, um, it, it probably ignores a lot of the complexities that we know exist within the human body. Behavioral influences are also very important. Um, how, well, how much do you value exercise? So is exercise something that you think is important in your life? Um, how easy is it for you to exercise? Do you get out and do that stuff? So you know, are you the kind of person that actually enjoys physical activity? Do you enjoy playing sports? Do you enjoy going for runs or walking? Or do you absolutely hate it? Um, and that could be you know, a large factor in how much of that percentage of your total energy expenditure goes to physical activity versus, uh, versus is it a high percentage or is it a low percentage? If it's a high percentage, you're probably a very active person. Another thing to contribute is what do you do in terms of transportation? Are you someone that's willing to bike to places? Are you willing to walk to the store as opposed to drive to it? Can you walk to the store instead of driving to it? Are you able to bike to work, walk to work, use uh, you know other means of transportation to get from point A to B? Do you take the stairs instead of the escalator or the elevator? All buildings now, um, for a lot of reasons, have me ways of getting up and down without involving walking. You can take elevators, escalators, many different forms of transportation. Are you someone that will take the stairs versus the elevator given the option? And another big thing um, that can actually contribute to this are societal influences. Another major influence in terms of energy expenditure um, and energy intake is as actually socioeconomic status. So uh, one of the things that we've learned is that there is an inverse correlation between um, average income and obesity rates. So in other words, the less money you have, the more likely you are to be obese. Uh, one of the major reasons for this likely has to do with the fact that it is more expensive to eat healthy. Eating fresh greens and produce and, and, and non-prepared foods is expensive. It's also time consuming because you actually have to have the ability to make foods. Quite often people in lower socioeconomic um, brackets they don't have access. They can't afford those healthy foods. They work multiple jobs. They don't have the opportunity to cook healthy meals when they can. And, and as a result, they often are sort of forced to eat foods that aren't as healthy for us, prepared foods, fast foods, things like that. The downside is those foods tend to be high in calories and low in nutrient content. So there's a problem on that end as well. So what are some evidence-based guidelines that we should go by if we're hoping to maintain uh, proper energy balance. We're hoping not to gain too much weight or also be underweight. Well, evidence tells us that we should uh, have a diet that is rich in a variety of fruits and vegetables. Um, these are going to obviously be very nutrient dense food sources uh, that are not high in calories. We should also be consuming a fair amount of grains. About half of those should be whole grains. Um, these are great for in terms of uh, not only nutrient content, but they also contain um, lots of fiber and things that help our body to digest foods. Low fat dairy is also uh, a great a great source of, of nutrition. So things like low fat milk, um, yogurt, uh, cheeses, these can be very healthy. Obviously they shouldn't be a, a huge part of your diet, but they should be contributing. They're, they're high in lots of nutrients, things like, uh, like calcium, for example, uh, vitamins uh, that we need can be found in low, uh, low, fat, uh, low fat dairy. There's also, uh, we should also be eating uh, a variety of lean meats. So things like uh, uh, lean beef, uh, poultry, fish are great sources of protein. Eggs are also a good source of protein, although they are high in cholesterol, so uh, eat them somewhat sparingly. And then also there are a variety of healthy oils that we need to get into our diet. So uh, things like uh, olive oil are a great source of, of fat in our diet that um, also don't come with a high cholesterol content uh, in that case. What we should be avoiding, we should be avoiding foods that are high in salt. We should be avoiding foods that are extremely high in fat and cholesterol. We should be trying to stay away from the processed foods. Um, you know, things that essentially, like we've been talking about through, uh, throughout s several of these videos, things that, um, that have a lot of calories, but very few of the nutrients we need in order to survive. In terms of exercise, um, the recommendations 
uh, are basically that we should be getting somewhere around two and a half hours of light exercise per week or an hour and a quarter or so of, of um, you know, extreme, uh, you know, sort of aerobic workouts. So if you're going to do high energy uh, workouts, an hour and 15 to an hour and a half is, is good. Um, at that point, we actually do see some health benefits to exercising, but you've got to kind of get to that level if you're going to get those benefits. You actually see better benefits if you're able to up it to five hours of light activity or two and a half hours of strenuous activity throughout the week. Taken together, what I hope you've gotten from this video is that um, our body is going to decide what to do with what we eat based on its energy levels. And in large part, we can control those. You know, are we, we, we want to be trying to eat, we're trying to eat as many calories as we are consuming on a daily basis. And there are lots of tools out there to help us figure out about what that should be. If we're eating too much food and we're eating more calories and we're expending, then we're going to gain weight. Why? Because our body's not going to waste that energy. It's going to take it and it's going to store it for later, often in the form of fat. If we're eating fewer calories than we need, then our, we, our bodies aren't getting the nutrition it needs in order to survive. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, today we talked about factors that affect energy intake and energy expenditure. As you can see, these things contribute to our energy balance and depending on uh, where we're at, whether we have a positive or a negative energy balance, um, that's going to decide what our body does with the foods that we eat. If we are taking in too many calories and not burning enough, then we're probably going to gain weight, often in the form of fat tissue because that's our body's preferred way of storing energy and this leads to obesity. If we're taking in too few calories, our body's going to have to rely on uh, already established energy stores in order to supply the energy we need to survive. Ideally, we would be getting equal amounts. We'd be taking in as much as we burn. That's it for our conversation from today. I hope you learned a lot and I hope to see you again at another one of my videos. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Bye.